So I'm at the Morgan Cemetery in Leroy Township. This is the first time I've ever visited this cemetery, but I've had a lot of people suggest this one to me. So I'm going to explore some history today. So come along and join me. Morgan Cemetery is located on Capitol Avenue Southwest, just north of the intersection of B Drive South in Leroy Township. It's also called Five Mile Road. It is approximately three acres in size and has burial dates dating to the early pioneer settlement years of Calhoun County in the mid 1800s. Let's begin our journey into history by looking at the namesake of this cemetery, the Morgan family. This amazing family, as you will soon learn, were known for their longevity and had quite an impact on the area. William Morgan Jr. married Susan Crook, both natives of Kent County, England, and together they immigrated to the U.S. in 1829, taking a voyage that took six weeks on a sailing vessel to reach New York. They then took a canal boat to Buffalo, where an oxen team was purchased, and they made their way to their new home in the woods near Mina, New York. William and Susan literally hewed a farm out of the wilderness in Chautauqua County while continuing to raise their family. They eventually sold that farm and moved to Erie, Pennsylvania, where they again engaged in farming with a fair amount of success. In 1867, William moved his family to Michigan and purchased the land surrounding where present-day Morgan Cemetery is here in Leroy Township, which incidentally included a small cemetery on a knoll known as Robinson Cemetery at the time. The cemetery was old then and covered with weeds and briars. Not liking the unsightly appearance, he cleaned it up and over time, recognizing it needed more room, on three different occasions sold small parcels of his land until it became a three-acre tract. Over time, from the additions of his own land, the name Robinson was slowly dropped and it became well known as Morgan's Cemetery. William and Susan had three sons, Jabez, William III, and Benjamin, and three daughters, Rebecca, Susan, and Mary. William Jr. passed away in 1869 at the age of 77, and Susan passed away three years later in 1872 at the age of 82. Susan Morgan was born in 1819 in England, and she was the oldest child of William and Susan Morgan. And she came to the U.S. with her parents when she was just eight years old. She was the oldest child, and she moved with her family first to New York, then Ohio, and finally to Michigan. At some point, she married and became Susan Hyde. At the time of her death, she was living with her sister Rebecca and Mary in Battle Creek, and was a widow. She died of heart trouble in 1911 at the age of 91. She's buried at Oak Hill Cemetery. Jabez Morgan was the oldest son, born in 1821, and he lived in Leroy Township most of his life. He was also a farmer and would raise eight children. He passed away in 1907 and is buried in Mather Voice Cemetery, also in Leroy Township. Now, Rebecca Morgan was born in England in 1824, and she immigrated to the U.S. with her parents in 1828 when she was just four years old. At some point, as a young woman, she returned to England and married John Highland in 1844 in Maidstone, Kent, and together they would have two children, a son named William and a daughter named Florence. She would become a widow at the age of 26. She would return to the U.S. with her children to be with her family while they were still in Erie, Pennsylvania, and later move with them to Michigan. She began working with her sister Mary in the millinery business in Erie, Pennsylvania, which that is the craft of designing and making women's hats. When they moved to Battle Creek, they opened a new shop and ran that business for 40 years in downtown Battle Creek with tremendous success. Her brother William built the Morgan Block in the city and reserved a space for her millinery store with her sister as well as a residence. Today, this would be right near the intersection of Michigan Michigan Avenue and Carlisle Street, where there's a parking garage. It shows up next to a creamery on the Sanborn Fire map in 1907. Her daughter Florence worked with her in the business, and Rebecca would pass away in 1911 
at the age of 87. William Morgan III was born in 1826. He was the last child in the family to be born in England, and he came to the U.S. with his parents when he was just two years old. Can you imagine taking a voyage of six weeks on a sailing vessel with four young children? After he became older, he had gotten into the dairy business when he was 21 years old, living in Erie, Pennsylvania. He stayed in that area over 21 years, and eventually moved to Bedford Township and purchased a farm. In 1862, he married Eleanor Gordon, and together they would have two children, a daughter Jessie and a son Benjamin. Eleanor passed away in 1897. William eventually grew his farm to 370 acres by 1912. The Morgan Farm was known all over the county as a successful dairy farm with 34 dairy cows and other stock cattle. William would drive daily into Battle Creek to deliver produce and milk to his customers. It was said in his obituary that in his later years, he was nearly blind, but he still continued to deliver milk to his patrons, and his team of horses seemed to be endowed with an almost uncanny human intelligence that he knew right where to stop at every home where he made his deliveries. He passed away in 1913 and is buried at Oak Hill Cemetery. Today, in Battle Creek, Morgan Road still bears his name. Benjamin Morgan is buried in the Morgan Cemetery. He was born in 1829 on his parents' farm in Mena, New York. He came to Michigan when he was 25 years old through Canada and then through Michigan and on into Chicago and out into the Great Plains. He expected to go to California and decided to allow the flipping of a penny to solve the question for him if he should continue his journey west or return to the east. The coin's decision was east. He ultimately went to work for a lumberman in Pennsylvania and purchased a farm entirely on credit and proved his ability to pay for it in full within less time than was stipulated. He then went into the oil business in Mecca, Ohio, but this was a failure. So he bought a farm and began to raise cattle and ship them east. Around this time, his parents moved to Michigan and he joined them. He bought a 197-acre farm in Leroy Township and added to it over the years until at one time he was the largest landowner in Calhoun County. You can see it here on the 1894 Atlas. He was in the dairy business like his brother and also bred cattle and horses and raised celery. He was married twice. First he had married Harriet Tracy in 1852 and together they had eight children. Harriet passed away in 1890. He married again to Sarah Elizabeth Garrett in 1906. In May of 1917, he celebrated his 88th birthday with his family, but was already experiencing failing health at that point. Benjamin died in November of that year. Mary Morgan, the last child of William Morgan Jr. and Susan Crook, is perhaps the most amazing story of the entire family. She was the youngest child of this family, born in 1832 in Mena, New York. Throughout her life, she would tell stories of growing up in her childhood home, which was a log cabin with a wide fireplace. The blazing fire provided light from which her mother would read to them. She described how her mother learned to twist a piece of cloth and place it in a saucer of grease and later molded them into tallow candles. With the later development of the kerosene lamp, then gas, and electricity, Mary had lived through the whole cycle of illumination. Mary as an adult was only five feet in height. She was very small as a child, so much that when her mother first took her to school on the very first day, the teacher asked if she had brought the cradle also. She never grew up with dolls, but she had all kinds of live pets, gooselings being her favorite. Throughout her life, she loved birds and was known to always be feeding them outside her home. When she was 21 years old, Mary learned the millinery trade in Erie, Pennsylvania. To learn that trade in her day was a real undertaking. She knew the whole process of making hats from bleaching, blocking, pressing, and steaming them. She conducted her millinery business for 20 years before she moved to Battle Creek in 1872. 
Her sister Rebecca had worked with her in Erie, Pennsylvania for 10 years before she moved with her. Their business in Battle Creek employed 18 women. Mary never married and was known affectionately among her family and the people who knew her in Battle Creek as Aunt Mary. Her niece, Florence, worked with her and her sister in the millinery. At one time, she lived with Rebecca, Susan, and Florence and lived in a house on Garfield Street. They sold the millinery business in 1906. And after Susan and Rebecca died in 1911, Florence and Mary made a pact to always live together and care for each other. Once again, Florence was her niece and Mary was known as Aunt Mary. Mary was an avid reader her whole life and read the daily paper in its entirety. She loved her garden and would always set the table on special holidays and enjoyed visiting relatives and friends in the area, of which there were many. She lived to the astounding age of 103 and maintained good health her entire life. In fact, her family said that when she passed, in the days that preceded her death, they hardly noticed any decline in her condition. In her long obituary, she was described as naturally cheerful and hopeful. Aunt Mary radiated happiness and was beloved by all who knew her. For many years, she had been the inspiration of the Morgan family reunions. In the summer, it was Aunt Mary's picnic, and the winter, it was her birthday anniversary. In her later years, she was unable to take automobile rides and was said to have enjoyed sitting on her porch watching the world go by. She was the oldest living resident in Battle Creek at the time of her death in 1935, and she's buried at Oak Hill Cemetery. Now let's explore some of the history of the Rolf family in this cemetery. Early pioneers of the Leroy Township area. John Moses Rolf was born in Sturgis, Michigan in August of 1842. He was a direct descendant of John Rolf of Virginia, an English colonist of the Virginia colony who married Pocahontas, daughter of Chief Powhatan. And there has been a son named John in every intervening generation since, at least at the time of his obituary. At the age of four years old, his parents moved to Leroy Township and he lived here for 62 years until his death. He married Nancy Jane Morris in 1867 and together they would have three sons, Clarence, John, and Herbert. While working in his evening work in June of 1908, he suddenly fell down in paralysis, which sounds like they were describing a stroke. Fortunately, others were there and carried him into the house. A doctor was summoned, but not much was able to be done. His wife and three sons attended him day and night for a week, but he eventually passed away on June 20th. Nancy Jane Rolfe passed away in 1922 at the age of 78 at the home of her son, John. John Rolfe's oldest son was Clarence Rolfe, who was born in 1869. He became a merchant in an area which was at the time known as Pine Creek. He married Catherine Miller in 1891, and together they had two children, Minnie Bell and Fred. He divorced Catherine in 1909, filing on the grounds of desertion. I suppose Mrs. Rolf done R-U-N-O-F-T. Where's Cora, Cousin Walt? Couldn't say. Mrs. Hogwallop up in R-U-N-N-O-F-T. She must have been looking for answers. He was also listed as a grocer on findagrave.com. He remarried Mabel Hannah Carpenter in 1909. Clarence passed away at his residence in 1914, and he was only 45 years old. John's middle son was John W. Rolfe, who was born in 1871 and became a well-known dairy farmer in the area. John owned a 180-acre dairy farm for a number of years in Battle Creek Township, across the road from George Willard's property, and also land owned by C.W. Post. He was one of the first farmers in the area to go into the dairy business on such a large scale. For many years, he marketed his own dairy products in the city of Battle Creek. He had married Lottie Sprague in 1896. 
whose family is also largely represented in this cemetery. And together they would have four children, Grace, John, Raymond, and Wilbur. John eventually sold the farm to Ralph H. Holmes, who launched the Country Club Hills project. After the sale, he went into building homes with his son John Jr., and together they erected several homes adjacent to the present-day Country Club Hills. The city's first subdivision restricted to what was described as handsome residences. He opened up new streets and today one street named John R still carries his name. He passed away at the age of 81 in Tampa, Florida in 1953. He was buried in the family plot at Morgan Cemetery. Incidentally, his son John, who was John T. Rolfe, was killed in an automobile accident in Mishawaka, Indiana in 1936, and he's also buried in this cemetery. The youngest son of the original John Wolfe of this story was Herbert A. Rolfe, who was born in 1875. He also became a merchant, but his store was in the area known as Sonoma. In the last 30 years of his life, he had retired to Florida with his wife, Minnie. He passed away in 1956, and he's buried at Myrtle Hill Memorial Park in Tampa, Florida. He was 79 years old. Now let's visit some of the stories of the Sprague family, of which so many are buried here in Morgan Cemetery. Reverend Thomas Sprague came to settle the Leroy Township area with his parents, five of his brothers, and two sisters in 1838. They were originally from New York, and their parents were Jonathan Sprague and Margareta Carr, who were also from New York. Their grandfather on their mother's side was Levi Carr, who fought in the Revolutionary War. Jonathan bought government land in 1837 near Battle Creek, and their deed bore the name of President Martin Van Buren as a signature when they arrived. Unfortunately, Jonathan passed away shortly after he arrived in 1838. He and his wife are buried at Dubois Cemetery, and I had featured some of the story of Margaret, also known as Margareta, when I created a video on that cemetery. The brothers took up large tracts of government land and made these lands blossom and bear fruit in the many years they farmed here. They all had a genuine love for agriculture. Reverend Thomas Sprague married Lucy Millen, and together they had seven children, three sons and four daughters. He passed away in Kalamazoo in 1879 at the age of 67 from typhoid malaria, according to his death records in the county. He was one of the pioneer Methodist ministers who had been ordained by Bishop Ames in 1868 at a session of the Michigan Conference. Prior to that, he had been a licensed local preacher for 14 years. In 1838, the first Methodist class was organized in his log dwelling, which he built with his own hands, including all of the furniture in it as well. The Methodist church, which later became known as the Sonoma Church, was built largely from his labors and financial assistance. He was a well-traveled minister in the final years of his life, as I found him referenced in South Haven newspapers, delivering guest sermon in his time. His oldest son, Elliot Sprague, who was born in 1843, would continue the farming tradition and often told stories of his resourceful grandmother, Margaret Sprague, who was said to have cut with shears the first grain they grew on their property and then threshed the wheat with a blanket, ground it into flour of her own, and turned it into bread. He married Marie Baker in 1871, and together they had three children. Elliot passed away in 1908 at the age of 64, one month before his 65th birthday. He's buried at Morgan Cemetery. His middle son, Thomas W. Sprague, was born in 1855, and he bred livestock. He was a prominent owner of Holstein cattle, of which he dealt heavily. He married Libby Schwartz in 1874, and together they had three children. Libby passed away in 1931, and he later remarried. One of his daughters married John W. Rolfe, whom I mentioned earlier. In later years, he left Leroy Township and took up residence in Battle Creek, where he became a home builder. He built homes in the vicinity of Northeast Capitol Avenue and Magnolia, and also near Territorial Road and Southwest Capitol. 
He also became interested in Florida real estate and spent his winters there and became the owner of a lot of property near St. Petersburg. He was seriously injured in St. Petersburg at one point around 1925 after being hit by an automobile and was recovering for months. He eventually was saved by an operation at John Hopkins University Hospital in Baltimore where they restored the functionality of his brain and memory. He passed away in 1940 at the age of 85 at his home in Soresco after a brief illness. He's buried at Morgan Cemetery. Eddie Sprague was born in 1865 and was the youngest of his children. He married Frances Canwright in 1886 and she passed away in 1926. Together they had four children, three daughters and a son. He married Mary Catherine Lovejoy in 1929, and she passed away in 1947. Eddie worked as a millwright and a machinist in Battle Creek for 55 years. He died at his home on Hinman Avenue in Battle Creek at the age of 83. He is actually buried over in Bedford Cemetery. One of Reverend Thomas Sprague's brothers was Argallus Sprague who eventually moved to Vermontville, Michigan. He had a son named Silas Sprague, who was killed at the Battle of Spotsylvania in the Civil War. The headstone for Silas is at Morgan Cemetery and at one point was smashed to pieces, but someone took the efforts to restore it. So I thought I would show that to you because as you can see, it probably took quite a bit of work to put it back together. The next story I want to feature is that of Harriet Trethrick. Her headstone reads Harriet Treadthrick, but according to Find a Grave historians, this is not the correct spelling of her name. She was born Harriet Nelms in Berkeley, Gloucestershire, England in 1844. She married a Canadian named Henry Threthrake in Canada in 1866, and Henry changed the spelling of his surname to Threthrick sometime after 1873 when he migrated to Michigan. Together, they had 10 children. The first four were born in Canada. The remaining six were born in Berry County, where they first settled. They later moved to Leroy Township. Harriet died in March of 1902 under very sad circumstances. According to the article written on the day that she died in the newspaper, she'd been suffering from mental trouble for some time. Perhaps she was experiencing the early stages of what we know today as Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. In either case, the family had noted her condition and were trying to do the best they could to keep an eye on her. They lived in the area of Sonoma, not far from this cemetery. On the day before she died, she told her sister that she believed that she would take a walk and go over to her other sister's house, which was five miles distance. It was a journey that she'd made many times before, and the sister she spoke with had hoped that she would give up on the idea of the long walk because it was still cold out. However, she managed to slip away unnoticed by her other sister, and that was the last time she was seen that day. Her husband came home from work and asked about the whereabouts of Harriet, and was told she was going over to her sister's house. He did not give it much thought as his wife had often taken a walk over there and probably had stayed overnight a few times. Remember, this was a time period where it was common for people to walk long distances routinely. However, the next morning he learned from the other sister that she had never arrived and he became alarmed and began to search for Harriet. He was joined by about 25 men and boys from the area and they eventually found her at Mud Lake. She was half buried in the mire and waters at the edge of the lake and to all appearances was dead. When they examined her, they found she was still breathing slightly and they rushed her home and summoned a doctor. She ultimately died from exposure. A young boy told the Battle Creek Journal that he'd seen her walking towards the lake that morning, apparently making a shortcut across the field toward her sister's house. It was supposed that she had reached the edge of the lake and she sank into the mire and was unable to get herself out and remained in that condition until she was found almost 48 hours later. She passed away later on the day that she was found. She was 56 years old. Henry would remarry two more times and pass away in 1912 at the age of 72. His death certificate, interestingly enough, bears the original spelling of his name, Threthrake. The final story I want to showcase is that of a man named Peter Parker. Mr. Parker died of a spider bite in 1880? Nah, just kidding. Nope. 
nope, not at all. I couldn't find anything out about him at all. I just thought I would uh, throw that in there to see if I could catch you napping. No, now actually the final story that I'm going to feature finds its way into the story on the insistence of my dog, Blue. He was outraged when he heard about this one. He wanted me to include it here as a public service announcement to humans. However, I think he's a bit biased, so I'm going to let you decide on that one. So here goes. It is the story of Dudley Cotton. According to a history of Calhoun County, Dudley Cotton was born in Vermont and his parents were of English lineage. He came to Michigan settling on government land and hewn a farm out of the wilderness. There was not much else available on his life, but there was just two sentences about the mention of his demise. It was published in the Battle Creek Journal on June 15, 1893. It reads, Dudley K. Cotton, an early pioneer of Leroy, died of blood poisoning, the result of the bite of a cat. And there you have it. Yes, Blue, I told them. I told them. Anyway, Dudley had two sons, John and Samuel Cotton. John would serve in the Civil War and had lived near Graham Lake for many years. He was also a farmer. He had married Dieter Ryder, and together they had two children, a son named Fred and a daughter, Lena. John moved to Battle Creek and passed away after some heart trouble from what sounds like he also had a stroke. He was 72 years old at the time he died. His son, Fred Cotton, received a detailed sketch in the history of Calhoun County as a prominent farmer and cattle raiser on 160 acres. In 1869, he married Michelle Hayes, and the rest of the sketch on his bio goes into a lot of detail about her parents and her ancestry, which is not really germane to the story. Incidentally, when Dudley Cotton's other son passed away in 1906, they auctioned off his property, and it read like this, four good workhorses, nine head of cattle, two hogs, and other farm implements and tools used on the farm. Any guesses on what he did for a living? Yes, Blue, we noticed that there were not any cats to auction off. There were not any dogs either. So what is your point? So that's going to conclude today's journey through history here at Morgan Cemetery in Leroy Township, Michigan. If you like today's video, please take a minute to hit the like button down there, subscribe to the channel, and be sure to share the video with others. And don't forget to check out my podcast, Tales of Southwest Michigan's Past, where I get to carry a lot more stories than I don't always have time to put on video form. And so until next time, thanks for watching.